so good morning. I'm Thorn Lay. I'm the president of IASPE for two more days. I'm not sure which of the dwarves I am, uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll pick Sleepy because it's been already a pretty busy uh, meeting for one, one week now. And uh, er every other president should pick one because you don't want to be dopey at the end. Uh. <laughs> It's a pleasure for me today to introduce uh, an IASPE uh, speaker, Vera Schlinwein, who is from the um, Alfred Wegener Institute in the Helmholtz Center for Polar and Marine Research. Uh, she is very uh, accomplished in the study of seismicity in the oceans and slow spreading ridge seismicity and tectonics, uh, cryo seismicity, swarms activity in the ocean environment, and She'll be speaking today about a, a trend in seismology, a revolution in seismology that's been taking place for some time to be able to understand what we used to think of as noise, very small signals, and to extract information from them. And now, at this point, with the guidance of geodesy, perhaps, we have now come to an understanding that many of these um, noise signals are actually active dynamic processes that we can use to study the Earth. So please, Vera, come to the stage. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored to uh, give this lecture. And of course, I have a very hard time now following up as a dwarf on Snow White. But um, I'll try to, to do my, uh, my best here. So um, harmonic tremor signals are more of a hobby of mine than my real expertise, which is as said in the seismicity of polar mid-ocean ridges. But I come involuntarily so often across harmonic tremor that I decided to give this um, overview lecture here. So why do I come so often across harmonic uh, tremor? I would like to show you here, if this is uh, working, um, and let you hear some examples. So um, harmonic tremor um, occurs in icebergs and is heard over large distances. And could we hear an iceberg singing for a moment, please? <laughs> Okay, thank you. And then um, it's known from volcanoes, of course. So can we hear this volcano, please? Okay, thank you. But even, these are very powerful, but even smaller systems like hydrothermal systems, they also produce uh, tremors. So could you click on this uh, geyser uh, signal? Thank you. You can hear it's a little bit different. And then finally, even in the absence of all of those, um, an ocean bottom seismometer can produce uh, quite a bit of a song as well. So could you try uh, the last, um, please? There's two voices, as you can hear. OK, so thank you. So you could already see that there or hear that there is some similarities, but also quite a bit of um, differences. And I would like to take you now through this lecture um, in three parts. So first, I will try um, to um, explain a little bit the phenomenology. How do tremors look like and so on? And then I uh, touch on some source processes. And I will show you then two case examples where I really like to see the volcanic, uh, the tremor and where I absolutely hate its um, ex appearance. So um, my first also involuntary um, encounter with harmonic tremor was during my master's thesis some 25 years ago where I found this signal. I was supposed to look for polarization signals on Mount Semeru, uh, Semeru volcano. Um, and I found this really even waveform, sort of a malfunctioning of the seismometer first, but all of the seismometers seem to malfunction from time to time. So it became clear that this is actually um, a signal and you can see the very, very even um, uh, waveform here. That's one of the characteristics. And it usually starts in an emergent way, not an impulsive way as we are used from earthquakes. So that's one typical appearance of um, tremor signals. Then tremor is lasting much longer typically than uh, an 
earthquake signal. So this varies also from tremor to tremor. Here again, this old signals from uh, Mount Semero volcano was typically around three to four minutes. Um, but here you can see the song of an iceberg may last over the order of several hours, sometimes with a break in between. And down here is a signal that we think comes from a hydrothermal source, and it lasted over more than four weeks. And you can see that there, during the day, there's two times where it seems to be stronger. So the duration of uh, harmonic tremor is really long. Of course, what's most characteristic about harmonic tremor is its spectral characteristics. So if you take, again, this old signal here and uh, you uh, calculate a Fourier transform, then you will see a sharp um, peaks in the spectra, and these spectra are, um, these peaks are at even spaces in a harmonic way with a fundamental frequencies and overtones. And sometimes this fundamental frequency is quite weak. It's often hard to actually see it, and some of the overtones may be more prominent. And all in all, over all the systems, typically the fundamental frequency is sort of between half a hertz and it goes up to eight hertz, sometimes a little bit higher even that. But all of the systems, no matter of it, if it's a volcano or an iceberg, it's about um, in this frequency range. So the real study of harmonic tremor is best done in spectrograms, when we can see the evolution of the spectral characteristics over time. So what's done here is taken a waveform like this, and then um, in every time slice you calculate a spectrum, and the spectral amplitude is then displayed um, as color, and you can see the frequency here and the time over here. And then you can see how such a tremor signal evolves over time. And here we can see already two, um, three characteristics. First of all, there's a wonderful suite of overtones um, that can be seen here, up to 18 overtones in this example. And then you can also see something um, that's called frequency gliding. That means that the frequency does not stay stable over time. And what I also would like to show you in this case here, it's called something like period doubling. That means that all of a sudden, here's a fundamental frequency the first overtone, second overtone, but sometimes you can see um, these uh, peaks here, these lines in between at exactly half um, the frequency. And this phenomenon is called period doubling, and that's seen in many of the um, harmonic tremor signals. So let us come to frequency gliding, which is so characteristic for many of the um, harmonic um, uh, um, tremor signals. Um, frequency gliding can occur in different shapes, and some of these shapes are typical for the respective sources. So the first example here is an iceberg, and you can see that it typically starts with a higher frequency, and then the frequency becomes lower. Sometimes there is a stop, and then it restarts again at low frequency and goes back to high frequency. All the time, the spectrum stays harmonic. That means that all the um, overtones shift in unison with the uh, fundamental frequency. The lower example is from a volcano. And there, the typical example in this case is that the frequency increases over time up to an explosive eruption. That's what you can see here, how the lines here go up. So that is um, rather typical for this environment. And then another form of uh, frequency uh, gliding that we observed on ocean bottom seismometer on the Knipovich Ridge, it's what I call a turtle back. You can see that the tremor, um, there's gaps when there's no tremor. And then when the tremor starts, it starts at low frequency, it picks up and makes such a uh, bump, and then it, um, the frequency goes down again before it stops. So we have different types of how the frequency of the tremor evolves over time. Then the tremor likes to stop fairly suddenly. I said that the um, onset is emergent, that's true, but if you look in the spectrogram, then you can see that tremor episodes seem to switch off fairly um, instantaneously, and they pick up um, again also quite instantaneously. You can see here now two modes of switching, um, the one here on this um, volcano. You can see that the tremor um, is present, and then all of a sudden it switches off. There is a phase without, and then switches on, 
down again, and so forth. In this example here from an iceberg, you can see that there is periods of very clear tremor, but in between there is not a, a, a gap, but there is a lot of signal. So this switches more to chaos rather than uh, to a quiet phase. So we can switch from zero to tremor and off again, but we can also switch from tremor to chaos and back to tremor. So that's different kinds of how a tremor um, evolves over time. Then sometimes the frequency and the amplitude of the tremor are not independent of each other. For um, the signal here is unfortunately not very clear in this, um, in this uh, uh, color figure here. When the frequency picks up and makes this bump, then the amplitude picks up um, again as well. By the way, here is another uh, wonderfully harmonic uh, tremor signal, but that's caused by a, by a ship. And um, here, in this case, um, that's from an iceberg, um, you can see that the amplitude of the tremor signal increases tremendously over time. It starts with low, um, freq uh, low amplitude and picks up again. And you can see here that the frequency during this phase goes down. So here the uh, relation between amplitude and frequency is opposite as in the other case. And then frequency gliding is sometimes not really smooth. Here is an example from uh, an Antarctic iceberg where you can see that the frequency glides very smoothly through this tremor period. But in this case here at this ocean bottom seismometer, you can already see in the waveform that there's different uh, levels, I would say, here, this intermediate level, a low level, and then a, a strong level. You can see the frequency varies nicely here. And then it locks into one certain frequency, and at this time it locks into a second frequency. And um, we've produced here this, um, this color plot. The uh, bright colors simply indicate um, how often we encounter a certain pair of amplitude and frequency. And you can see that there are preferred amplitude frequency combinations. And you can also see that as the frequency increases, the amplitude of this tremor signal increases, but there are certain levels that are preferred over others, and we call this mode locking or frequency gliding with some jerks in it. So um, this is the um, a summary of the features that we've seen in harmonic tremor and that we need to explain by the source um, spectra. Of course, we have um, harmonic spectra, the fundamental frequencies, as I said, in a certain range for all of them. Then a frequency gliding may occur in different shapes. The tremor sets on and switches off um, quite um, suddenly. We have period doubling, and there may be a relation between frequency and amplitude, and we may have things like mode locking. So what are the sources for the tremor? So we, there's a variety of physical processes that can produce harmonic um, oscillations, and we try to uh, conclude on them now from the spectral, from the characteristic that we observed. So the very early models were um, resonance models. That's, of course, you think of um, a vibrating um, organ pipes, for example, and you have a standing wave in a magma body, a cavity, and so on. But the problem with these uh, uh, models is while it's very easy to produce a sharp harmonics, um, it is difficult to get the large um, dimensions of the bodies you need um, to explain the fundamental frequency. Magma bodies must be very, very large. In this case, I drew a, a gas column um, and uh, a plug in this volcano and a moving magma um, a column below where you could change the, the frequency if this magma uh, column moved up and down. But how can you main maintain a 300 meter uh, conduit open in a volcano? So that's something that is quite uh, tricky. And so the uh, resonance models um, are, um, may apply in some cases, but they are, they are difficult. And it's also hard to understand how you can keep up a tremor in these um, situations. 
Another model that is more successful and can uh, use smaller dimensions uh, for resonance, that is if you have a fluid-filled crack that is excited by some uh, pressure transient, and then a crack wave evolves uh, at the boundary between the fluid and um, the solid, and this moves very slowly, so the dimensions of the resonator can be much, much smaller. And uh, you get obviously very efficient seismic coupling and produce a tremor. But still, you need to excite this crack for over a longer time to get um, many minutes of uh, tremor. And it's hard to imagine how frequency gliding could um, work. And of course, you usually have in a medium many, many cracks. So you should see many of these uh, resonating. But still, this model may explain, for example, um, the resonance of fluid filled cracks that are triggered during hydrofracturing. And here you can see a very nice um, spectrogram of a hydrofracturing experiment with uh, loads of cracks maybe vibrating. Um, there is in hydrofracturing several sources that could produce tremor um, from path effects to receiver effects or source effects, but there's also this uh, cloud of micro seismicity where you have resonance in these fluid filled cracks and you might get an, an entire um, choir of um, singing um, cracks here and as you can see they tend to uh, keep their frequency stable over time and don't uh, display so much frequency gliding because they would have to change their geometry. What is much more successful and can be applied in many situations, that is a, a very complicated nonlinear system of fluid um, flow induced oscillations. What you have to imagine is that the fluid is moving through a narrow crack or a, a conduit, and the walls of these conduits are deformable and react on the fluid as it passes through and deforms the wall. And this makes a very complex nonlinear system um, where you can then um, explain features like period doubling and a so-called period doubling cascade where the tremor then moves into, into chaos. And there are many uh, ways where you can imagine to um, make such a system when you have um, magma or a magma gas uh, moving through a volcano, even water forced to cracks in a glacier would produce this kind um, of signal. You can also imagine that frequency gliding can much more easily be explained as the flow speed changes, for example. And also um, you can imagine that if there is a high pressure forcing um, uh, the fluid through the wall, and then you can have a higher frequency and a higher amplitude, for example. Um, but uh, you need to have a certain flow speed and you need to keep up this uh, flow over time. And in an iceberg, for example, this may be um, tricky. But still, um, there's many varieties of this phenomenon. And one that I found particularly funny is so-called magma wagging. And um, this has been observed in a volcano that has a special um, geometry. It's got a, a foam annulus um, around a, a more or less solidified uh, conduit here. And gas moves through um, this, um, this, this foam here. And with the Bernoulli effect, um, it produces this half solidified magma in here to move back and forth and back like a, like a dog's tail. And as the uh, uh, gas is uh, picking up, this starts to shake back and forth stronger and stronger. And this has been used and modeled to explain this kind of tremor signal. So that's a modification of this flow induced phenomenon. But then there's a totally different source process as well. Any process that can produce something that is very rhythmically can produce a harmonic tremor signal. Like, for example, vortex, common vortex shedding, which is shown here in, in, in the movie. And what you uh, need to think of is that if you have simple, a very rhythmical process occurring and you convolve this with a source um, signal of some duration, then you may end up um, with a, a composed signal um, that looks already very much like a tremor. And in the spectral domain, this is the spectrum of this time series here, you multiply this with the spectrum um, of your um, source signal and then you get something like a tremor signal. So anything that occurs rhythmically enough um, is in principle able to produce a tremor um, signal. 
So um, in this case, it's very easy to get a harmonic spectrum, but it's important um, that you don't deviate from the rhythm more than about 10%. Then, then suddenly you lose the harmonic uh, character and you switch to this kind of chaotic um, signal. Frequency gliding is very easily explained, just um, um, having a faster or slower rhythm. And period doubling is if you imagine that every other beat of your rhythm is a stronger beat than the other one, then you get a period um, doubling. What's harder to explain is how to uh, lock into certain modes. So all of these uh, processes have their advantages and have their drawbacks. So in icebergs, for example, it has been shown that this rhythmically occurring um, tiny earthquakes actually produce a tremor signal. So that was discovered when an iceberg, a large one in Antarctica, was instrument, instrumented with seismometers. And these icebergs are caught in a bay and they move past each other in tidal cycles. And whenever they get in contact and start moving uh, past each other, you see this sequence of tiny little um, earthquakes if you are nearby that merge into tremor if you are further away. And so it starts uh, with a high frequency and then the iceberg slows down and slows down um, due to the contact. And then it stops here and then the tide turns and the iceberg starts to move back in the other direction and the polarity of the signal changes and the whole thing moves back. So this is how this chevron-shaped uh, harmonic tremor is explained in volcanoes. It's a sequence of mini earthquakes in rhythm. And the same has also been observed in uh, volcanoes where this fluid phenomenon uh, could be um, much more present. But also there, there are suits of mini earthquakes that um, merge into a sequence of tremor. So both processes again are uh, there in both systems. So now I would like to come to two um, case examples that I encounter on um, ocean bottom um, seismometers. So the first um, deployment um, was on the Southwest Indian um, Ridge, and I looked at uh, power spectral density plots to check on the quality of the um, seismic installation. And you can see this station here, that's a station here. This is how it should like, and it produced this enormous signal here, and it only occurred over a certain time this signal. So there was something anon uh, anomalous and none of these other stations showed the same uh, type of signal. And then when I zoomed in, calculated spectrogram, I found this enormous tremor signal. It lasted for 39 days, even longer maybe, but the seismometer uh, ran out of power at that time. And you can see here a beautiful tremor and it's modulated here um, at tidal cycles very clearly over a very long time. Um, so um, what we did, we did an analysis of this tremor. That's a very busy um, uh, plot, but I'll, I'll take you um, through that. So at first we looked at the power of the tremor over time. And you can see that the power um, is larger in certain uh, time periods. Then it showed um, that the um, tremor signal is very nicely polarized. And then we looked at time periods when, the, uh, when this polarized signal shows up. Um, and by combining both, um, we defined tremor times when there's a polarized strong signal. And you can see this here is the number of earthquakes in that area, and the tremor signals coincide with three earthquake swarms. A major earthquake swarm here, a smaller one here, and then one here. From the polarization, we can get the direction to the source and the dip of the source, and so what we try to do is try to locate this tremor. Um, the ocean bottom seismometer was placed here, and the dots are now the earthquake swarms. So the first earthquake swarm happened. It migrated as well. Um, so that was a sign for an intrusion. And the tremor signal um, points in the direction where the migration started, but to a shallow source. We don't know the distance, but here's an axial volcanic ridge. Here's the start of the uh, um, earthquake signal. So we presume that it may be something in the area here maybe water um, going through this, um, uh, um, uh, through this axial volcanic ridge. And then the second larger um, earthquake swarm happened, um, again started in the same region, and the tremor signal now moves downwards, still in the start direction here, 
and all of a sudden um, we may have a tremor signal that goes deeper down. And the whole thing is modulated by the tide with low tides having a higher tremor signal. So what we think, what we see here is um, something uh, like a um, hydrothermal system that is in place um, because the um, signal picks up already before the um, intrusion um, swarms. It lasts so much longer than the um, earthquake swarms that we think that we see some hydrothermal system that is disturbed by intrusion or by faulting and that the uh, fluid flow maybe produces tremor in different areas and as we change the system, different parts of this um, hydrothermal system become active. But this is a pure speculation because we have hardly any other observation from this area and we don't even have a single CTD or something to tell us that there is a hydrothermal plume at all. So when I saw this signal then at a volcano on Knipovich, which I became really excited and I was hoping, wow, I see again this wonderful hydrothermal tremor, but then unfortunately the next station away from it showed the signal again, and this station, there's no volcano nearby at all, and all of the station in our network, and it was an extensive network of 27 stations, showed this kind of signal. So um, I got uh, pretty much worried. Um, but um, I then also um, had a look at uh, two different type of instruments that were deployed in the uh, network and then I could see that on the same day they showed different frequencies. Um, and also very typical for this region, this is our network on, uh, on Knipovich Ridge. Um, it's a very extended network over 160 kilometers with 27 OVS. The ocean currents here, the red colors are temperature um, uh, or uh, red and blue colors and the arrows are the distances where we pick the OBS um, up away from their deployment position. So there's a strong ocean current in this area, especially in the, this warm water moving northwards here. So it became clear that we maybe have also, this is of course surface currents, but we may have some problems with currents on acting on our um, OBSs. Then we did a very detailed um, uh, analysis of this tremor, uh, one year of data on 27 stations. We used an automatic tremor detection with the so-called harmonic strength index, and that got us the fundamental frequencies and overtones um, over the entire uh, time. And um, I explained to you already, we saw these typical um, turtle uh, back shapes. We also see some uh, tidal modulation. Um, but as you could hear in the beginning, we also heard two sources. Um, there was a second singer in this uh, signal. You can see this here. So here's the, here's the turtle shape signal. And then there's another signal um, up here. You can beautifully see here again the mode locking. Um, so there's something happening that's different from the tremor signals that we've seen uh, before. And we also could see um, by looking at uh, neighboring stations, these three stations where currents were at the surface very strong. And this is now over a period of 200 days, we had a look when tremor was occurring. And you can see that between these three stations, there's the same pattern of tremor um, occurrence in a regional uh, correlation that tells us about um, ocean uh, currents. So what's happening here? We think um, that we um, have a vortex shedding um, phenomenon on the OBS. And OBS has many protruding um, um, uh, poles here, the, the flagpole, and here um, there's a rope um, where the recovery buoy is attached. And uh, we may get vortex shedding at these ropes or structure. The vortex shedding frequency depends um, on the current velocity and the diameter um, of the rope. And this is what we think happens when the tremor picks up here at velocities of about 10 centimeters um, per second. Then the velocity goes up. And then if the uh, frequency um, of the vortex shedding um, comes in the vicinity of the eigenfrequency of this rope, then you start mode locking into the eigenfrequency of uh, this rope or potentially the second singer may be here, the flag. And then you start getting these modes and also um, overtones. So this is what's happening here. And I can tell you that this signal is really troublesome. Um, the um, uh, earthquakes we wanted to see are in a frequency range between 3 and uh, 15 hertz. And uh, the records 
50% of them are spoiled up to a frequency of about 8 hertz. So that's really a problem, and it's been throughout this entire um, network. So we need to find a way um, of shortening or designing a clever length of the rope so that we don't uh, um, uh, measure too often ocean bottom currents instead of um, our seismic signals. So then I would like to warn you about uh, another um, way um, of producing tremor. That is, you should cleverly think about your means of seismometer transport. This signal here comes from a helicopter flying around uh, Mount Hecla volcano in Iceland. The frequencies are somewhat higher um, out of the typical range, but some volcanoes also do show frequencies, uh, fundamental frequencies of above 10 hertz. You can see again frequency gliding. The helicopter um, has uh, the same rotor uh, rotation speed all the time, but as it moves, this is uh, an effect of the uh, uh, Doppler, Doppler effect that you can see as the helicopter turns and um, uh, changes its uh, position relative um, to the seismometer. And then there's another record here. Um, this is from an ocean bottom seismometer that was deployed underneath sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. And you can see um, a very nice uh, record with lots of uh, vertical lines that are earthquakes, but there's also a very strong horizontal line. And um, this line here, you can see in the second spectrogram, the second spectrogram, the one here to the left, that is an uh, acceleration measurements made on the hull of um, Polarstern, our icebreaker. And you can see that um, these hull vibrations and the shaft line vibration couple into, this, into the ground. This is a seismic record, not a hydrophone. And um, this record is 35 kilometers away from uh, the ship at the time. So um, uh, this signal carries also very far and you may spoil your own seismogram just um, by your means of bringing your seismometer to your survey site. So um, I hope I could show you that uh, tremor signals occur really frequently in many, many um, places. They have a variety of characteristics, and some of these characteristics help us to understand the source processes uh, behind. But there's many, many uh, ways how you can uh, um, produce such a harmonic tremor signal. And it's very important to have additional observations and clues, because otherwise you may easily confuse these uh, tremor signals and cannot conclude on the source process. Thank you very much. So the earth makes many sounds mm -hmm. and they're interesting to figure out. We, we see similar thing with Mars now to try and <laughs> interpret many of the strange sounds that we're getting. So do we have any questions for Vera? If you do, please go to the microphone. That was really a fascinating talk, and I had never heard of glacier singing <laughs> or icebergs. So my question is, now that there's climatic change and possibly melting of glaciers and more fracturing, and they might be going to mush, do you expect that there's going to be a change in the singing or the componentry of the frequency bandwidth that you will see in your uh, recordings of uh, iceberg sounds? Well, the iceberg sounds, it's typically um, large and arctic um, icebergs, and they start singing when they run aground or uh, uh, encounter each other. So um, I don't know what will really happen. If they become thinner, then they maybe don't uh, run into ground as often, so that would switch off some of the songs. But if there's more fragments around, they, they may uh, scrub against each other more often. So I'm not sure if this, um, if there will be a correlation, but any glacial water flow, for example, that may pick up and that produces a lot of uh, tremor um, as well. And I think that's a very good means to understand the glacial and monitor the glacial water um, system. The, some of these tremors are not really harmonic. They are more like uh, a bit chaotic, but definitely tremor signals help to, to, to monitor fluid flow in glaciers. And there I see quite a bit of potential. Thank you so much, very exciting presentation. I have a question, like very basic question. 
As far as I understood, you're trying to study sound. And then I found you have also other observations like accelerometer and tide gauge and that helicopter, the airborne signals. I'm not sure how you are correlating this. What are you looking for to well, all of, the, all of the sounds I showed are actually recorded on seismic stations. So even the helicopter that is flying in the air uh, produces a, uh, a signal on a ground-based seismometer. And the same is true for the ship. In this case, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't work with these signals from the seismometer alone until the ship engineer showed me by chance the spectrograms and I discovered this is exactly the lines that I see. So this was a lucky incidence where I had something uh, to compare but otherwise all of these signals really occur in seismometers and that's ground motion signals okay, coupled in from sources we have time for one more short question yeah you, you mentioned that these uh, these tremors basically are within a narrow frequency range I've forgotten the exact numbers mm -hmm. but what's the fundamental reason for this and are you sure you wouldn't be able to see other tremors at other frequencies, if you haven't been looking at it, just because the instruments cannot look at them? Um, well, most of the tremors, I don't know if there is actually a reason for it, but most of the tremor, no matter what system, are in this frequency range. Some volcanoes tend to go up during this increasing phase to higher frequencies, and then artificial sources are typically at higher frequency. But I don't know if there's actually a reason why, I mean, why should a volcano and gas moving through a volcano do that at the same speed or as an ocean a current flowing past the seismic? Um, I don't know. The instrument should be sensitive over a larger um, uh, frequency range. So um, it's just, I would say it's, it's, it's coincidence, but one could dig for that and try to find out wh whether there's a, a common uh, phenomenon behind it. Oh, okay, let's thank Vera again for a very excellent talk. We have to move on.